Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James P. Cole. I work with Bill King in mechanical science and engineering, as well as Paul Braun in material science and engineering. And today I'm going to talk about our work on high power lithium ion micro batteries. And so the miniaturization of electronics is really, really fascinating from applications like cell phones to really, really tiny sensors. Um, there's a lot of amazing technologies that have been developed strictly because of the miniaturization of these electronics. But one of the biggest component of electronics that hasn't been successfully miniaturized is the power sources that drive them. And so you can imagine a whole new slew of technologies that could be enabled if you could finally miniaturize the power sources. And so I'm going to talk about micro batteries, or basically miniature batteries today. And so give me a quick overview on why micro batteries are important, or what they look like. Um, I'm going to, here's the pointer, here we go. Um, I'm going to look at first thin, there's two, basically two major types of micro batteries. Um, there's thin film batteries and there's three dimensional batteries. Um, thin film batteries are actually very successful batteries. They're about a hundred million dollar market today. Um, but one of the big challenges is that the total thickness of the battery is only about 15 microns thick. So that means the total energy density is limited by the total surface area. And so if you think about electronics um, or a microelectronic device, maybe it's about a millimeter by a millimeter. If you want a thin film battery to power that electronic device, because it's so thin, the total surface area is going to be on the order of tens of millimeters by tens of millimeters. And so to really get a micro battery that's scalable to the same size as the electronics that they drive, you need to go into things called three dimensional micro batteries. And these are basically batteries that have just three dimensional electrodes, so electrodes that scale in the vertical direction. And so there's been a couple of demonstrations of these. But the main challenges for these types of batteries is first micro battery integration and fabrication. And so there's only been really four successful fully integrated micro batteries that have been reported in literature. And that's because it's very difficult to fabricate an uh, anode and a cathode that are tens of microns wide and only a few microns away from each other. Additionally, these micro batteries suffer from high performance. And so today I'm going to talk about our micro batteries. And our micro batteries are three dimensional. Um, they also have a fully integrated anode and cathode, and they have exceptional performance. And so uh, this is what our, uh, basically a schematic of what our micro batteries look like, and I'll kind of go into the details of how we make these later. But just looking at the rate performance, or the performance of these micro batteries compared to other micro batteries, we can see a huge increase. Um, at a low rate discharge, so this is a discharge that takes about an hour, you can see that the power density of our batteries is about six and a half times other previous micro batteries and our energy density is about twice that of the micro batteries. So already at low discharge rates, we have higher performance than your typical three-dimensional micro battery. What's really fascinating with our micro batteries is that at high rate discharges, we can achieve power densities that are about 2,000 times higher than other micro batteries. And so first I'm going to talk to you about how we achieve such high energy density and high power density. Um, first let's go over how a, micro, or how a battery works, um, just to re-familiarize all of us. You kind of have two electrodes, you have an anode and you have a cathode. Um, and basically you store lithium ions in the anode, and then as you discharge the battery, the lithium ions become, are, are moved to the cathode, and the electrons are moved through your external circuit and re-meet with the lithium ions in the cathode. And that's kind of your basic process. It's very, very simple. Um, and so the two kind of main parameters for how you determine if a battery is good or not is its energy density and its power density. And this is actually also very simple. Energy density is related to thermodynamics, and power density is related to kinetics. So the more lithium ions you can store, the higher energy density you have, the faster you can move those lithium ions and electrons back and forth, the more power you can have. And the way, kind of the limitation with current micro batteries, or current batteries in general, is that they can store a good amount of energy density. Um, not as much as like an electric car, but a lot higher than like supercapacitors, but they can't discharge that energy very quickly. And kind of the major resistances to discharging that energy very quickly are lithium transport through the anode and cathode, and so that's limited by diffusion. Electron transport through anode and cathode, and that's limited by conduction. And then lithium transport through the electrolyte, and that's limited by diffusion also. And so what we created is a microbattery architecture um, seen here that allows us to basically con precisely control the diffusion distances and have a highly conductive electrode so we can really increase the rate at which we move the lithium ions and electrons across the battery and so that gives us a really high power density. And the way we do it, and so this is just a unit cell of our micro battery architecture, is with what we call a bicontinuous um, three-dimensional interdigitated micro or and nanoporous electrode. So it's a whole bunch of adjectives, but all it really means is we start off with a metal foam. Um, and so our foam is made out of nickel. And then we coat it with a thin film of active material. 
And so that thin coating allows us to control the diffusion distance of lithium through the active material. And because the time constant for diffusion is related to the um, distance squared divided by diffusivity, by significantly reducing that diffusion distance, we can drastically reduce the time it takes for lithium to diffuse to the material. We also, with our inner digitated design, can control the separation between the electrodes to increase power density. And finally, the nickel scaffold allows us to have really highly electrically conductive material, so electrons can move in and out very, very easily. And so this is a schematic of our full microbattery cell. And this is the unit cell that you saw um, in the last slide. And basically, our electrodes are just made of lots of these unit cells that are patterned in an interdigitated fashion. So interdigitated fashion is basically if you took two combs and you were to um, put them together so that the comb fingers were interconnected but not touching. And that's exactly what our microbatteries look like. And the separation between the anode and cathode allows us to control the diffusion distance um, in the electrolyte as well as the other diffusion distances I talked about earlier. But here you can just see some SEMs of the microbatteries that we create. You have the anode and cathode. They're about 15 microns tall and about 30 microns um, wide, and you can see the uh, active material we coat on it here. Um, we have nickel coated, or lithium and manganese oxide coated on nickel for the cathode, and we chose this material um, because it's easy to deposit, as well as it's very, it's used a lot in commercially available batteries. Also for the anode, we use nickel tin uh, coated on nickel, and we use nickel tin because it's a high energy density material, and so we can extract a lot of energy from this material. But what's interesting, so if you look at the pore size of these, it's about 500 nanometers in diameter, and then the interconnects between the pores are about 250 nanometers in diameter, just to give you a little bit of scale. And so with this microbattery architecture, we can create a microbattery that's fully integrated, so we have the anode and cathode on a single substrate, but also has really, really high performance. Um, so now I'm going to show you kind of how we make these microbatteries. First, we're going to just focus on how you make one single electrode. Um, first, you start off with a substrate that has a highly conductive material on top. Um, we usually use gold. And then we uh, use a self-assembly process to uh, assemble polystyrene spheres that are about 500 nanometers in diameter onto the surface of this material. We then take this uh, material, we deposit it um, nickel through it in an electrode deposition bath, and then we remove the polystyrene. And so that gives us the inverted foam, basically. So it's just a highly um, porous metallic foam. And then we deposit our active material on top over here. But this is how we kind of integrate it into a full microbattery system. Um, we start off with the glass substrate. And on top of the glass substrate, we have the interdigitated gold electrodes pattern. Um, and so that allows us to precisely control the diffusion distance um, through the electrolyte. And then we do the same process I just mentioned. We assemble polystyrene, deposit nickel through it, and then we etch the polystyrene. And so now we have these interdigitated nickel foams, basically, on top of a substrate. But because in a battery, the anode and cathode have to be electrically isolated from each other, um, we can use this to our advantage. And the way we use this is we deposit the anode material by electrode deposition, and then we remove the substrate from that um, electrolytic plating bath, and then we deposit the cathode material using electrode deposition again. And so it seems really simple, um, but really it's, uh, it enables a lot of technologies in microbatteries because it's so difficult to precisely deposit these materials at the micron scale next to each other. But we're used, by utilizing the um, electrode, or the, basically the fact that they're electrically isolated and the ability to deposit these materials using electrode deposition, we're really enabling the integration of full microbattery cells. And then finally, we just do some um, chemical processing, and then we can test our batteries. So we look at some of the performance data for our batteries. Um, we use basically the first plot we're going to look at is a C-rate performance plot. And so it's a plot that's kind of used a lot by battery experts. But basically, um, a C-rate performance plot basically plots the voltage profile of your battery um, versus a whole bunch of different discharge rates. And so a 1C discharge rate basically discharges your battery in an hour. If you have a 10C discharge rate, you basically discharge that battery at 10 times the current density. And so if you want to think about how commercial batteries um, perform, at a 1C rate, um, they usually can extract almost 100% of their energy density. But at a 10C rate, so if you were to try to discharge them at 10 times the current density, they would only be able to extract maybe a few percentage points of their entire energy density. And that's because of the internal resistances inside the battery. 
but if you look at our micro battery technology, you can see that even at a thousand C, so that's a thousand times the current density that we're discharging this battery, we can extract 30% of our total energy density, which is a huge improvement over commercial batteries and other battery technologies. But what that enables us to do is really get high power density, but still maintain a high energy density. And so we're not longer trading off high power and high energy. We're able to get high power and continue to get high energy density. And so we'll also look at the cycle performance of these micro batteries. Um, and to do that, we basically cycle these at really low rates, so about an hour discharge each for several cycles. And then we discharge them at really high rates. And all we're really looking for is to see if the micro batteries kind of uh, if their structure gets degraded, or if the electrochemistry is somehow, um, there's some sort of side reactions in the micro battery when you discharge them at high rates. And the way we can tell that is if you discharge it at a really, really high rate, and then you bring it back to the low rate discharge, if you can't get the same amount of energy that you can get before, then you know you're doing some sort of um, degradation to the system. But we can see that um, after discharging at really high rates and bringing it back to the low rate discharge, we're able to, able to extract basically the same amount of energy um, as before, which means that the high rate energy density doesn't really affect um, the total performance of the micro battery system. And so now let's look at kind of how our micro batteries compare to other technologies. And so to do that, we're going to look at a Rigoni plot. And so a Rigoni plot plots power density versus energy density. And basically, it just gives you a really good landscape for all the different energy storage technologies out there. Um, you have fuel cells over here, um, highlighted in blue, that have really high energy density, but you can't extract that energy density very quickly. Over here, you have supercapacitors, which have a lot of power, um, but they have very, very small energy, and you kind of have batteries in between. But what's kind of um, obvious is that there's this trade-off. You either have really high energy density and really or really high power density. It's really difficult to get both. Um, and so what a lot of people are focusing on is moving techno or finding technologies that are up here in this area where you have really high power density, really high energy, energy density. And so that's where our batteries are starting to move towards. And you can see the data points for our batteries um, highlighted in the different colors labeled A through H. And so these are all just different configurations, different electrode spacing, different pore sizes, um, giving us different performance. But basically you can see that at low rates, our energy density is about similar to other um, battery technologies. But our power density is higher um, than even some of the best supercapacitors, so even capacitors that are recently published in articles like Science and Nature. The power density of our batteries are higher than those. And so that's really kind of fascinating because when you look at um, how you build a car or how you build a phone, you always have these trade-offs. You either have to have a battery or a battery and a supercapacitor. But now you can have one single technology that kind of um, meets your energy and power density requirements. And so enables a, a whole sort of kind of new interesting applications. And so kind of, and, and let me give you an example. I think I have enough time. Yeah. To give you an example of kind of how that would, uh, or how you realize that in a scale we're all familiar with. Um, and so first, I want you to think about your car battery. And so your car battery is about uh, 12 inches long by about 6 inches wide and about 6 inches to 12 inches tall. So it's actually a pretty sizable lead acid battery. And the reason why it needs to be that big is because you need to power 4,000 watts to start your engine, to get your engine to start cranking. Um, but what if your battery dies? Right? So you have to go either replace it or you have to go um, get it jumped by your friend next door. But what if you could just take your cell phone and plug it into your car and start your battery with your cell phone? Well, with our energy storage batteries, our energy storage technology, we're enabling um, devices that are the size of your cell phone that can have the same power density as the car battery in your car. And so that's kind of the, a scale where I think we're all more familiar with, but that's kind of the difference between the power densities of our batteries and the power density of kind of commercial, conventional batteries. And so with this work, we fabricated 3D porous interdigitated microbattery architectures with short ion transport lengths. Um, we also integrated the anode and cathode on a single substrate using electrodeposition, creating a fully integrated microbattery cell. And finally, we demonstrated high power density up to 2,000 times improvement with still very good energy density. And I would like to acknowledge um, some of our funding sources, the, particularly the Center for Nanoscale Chemical Electrical Mechanical Manufacturing Systems and the Department of Energy um, Graduate Research Fellowship Program for funding me. And with that, I'd like to invite questions. If you do have questions, can you please speak into the microphone so everyone can hear you? So 
that, that was a good uh, lesson in uh, the difference between uh, power density and energy density and how you're optimizing uh, those. But isn't there a third important parameter for batteries and that is how many charge discharge cycles they can be tolerated? Yeah. So let me go back to here. So And so there's a lot of trade-offs between recyclability and how, what kind of technologies you would apply your batteries to. Um, so one thing to think about, so this is, I brought this to this particular page because it shows our recyclability. So after 15 cycles, we get about 70% of our energy that we extract. So the recyclability of our batteries is not that great. Um, but the reason why, basically we lose 5% energy per cycle. Um, and so it, I, think, I think that's kind of where your, your question is targeted, right? So we look at, um, so the power density is limited by diffusion in the cathode. And so we can use cat or diffusion simulations in the cathode to really kind of understand the space for how we can achieve higher power density, how we can achieve higher energy density. And yes, one of the things we can do is we can decrease the pore size um, to increase the, the power density. But one of the drawbacks of that is we've only been able to go to 330 nanometers before we get fabrication problems. it um, using galvanostatic um, 1C charge basically and then we hold it at the top charge so at 4 volts for about 20 minutes. Is that actually Yeah, okay, so, yeah, so now that's part of the question. So we only demonstrated 15 cycles here um, and so we can charge this basically continuously um, as long as we want but the problem is we lose capacity over time. Right, and so uh, we lose about 5% capacity after each cycle. And so we can, it's not really gonna, most batteries don't fail. Um, if they do fail, usually uh, what happens is you might get uh, an SEI layer or some sort of dendrite that forms between the anode cathode, similar to the way batteries fail in commercial ba um, batteries. But actually most of our batteries don't really fail by that case. What happens is they run out of energy density because of the capacity fade. Well, using your car battery analogy, mm -hmm. uh, there comes a time when it's still a really good electron, so it's just not enough to turn anything or make it work. So is your battery end up the same way? Yeah, I mean, if you were to cycle it um, like 30 times, the power density would be reduced and the energy density would be reduced. Yeah.